All right, guys, welcome to Powerline Podcast. Welcome to episode 108. This week's guest is Jason Novak. I first met Jason a few years ago at the Whiskey City Rodeo. I get into the full story with him on how we met and, and how that went down at the rodeo. It's super cool. A few years later, he shoots me an email, says, hey, I was on the, on the poll with you, I competed with you at the rodeo. I would love to be on the podcast. Turns out this guy's been to the international rodeo 22 times. He's doing some incredible work with uh, this organization that he developed called Climbing for Kids, raising money for St. Jude's Hospital. We're gonna have all the details on how you can donate to this, this really cool foundation, this really cool cause. And again, we get into all the details in the podcast. So let's get this one going. Jason Novak, 108, let's go. All right, Jason, uh, welcome to the show. Thanks for reaching out uh, over the internet there, reaching out and, and saying hi. And uh, I appreciate when people reach out and, you know, say, hey, c- come on the show. Um, totally interested in everybody's story. So, yeah, but just thanks for reaching out. Thanks for being on the show. Welcome. All that good stuff. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me on here. I really appreciate it. Yeah, heck yeah. Um, so I usually start way back when, but just, uh, first time I met you, like we were just talking before, before the show started here. Uh, I wanted to talk about that a little bit. I want to talk about the whiskey city rodeo. And first time I met you was at the whiskey city rodeo. And I was actually just a chaperone. Um, I wasn't even competing or supposed to compete in the, in the event. I just had a couple of other teams there and Olin, uh, Olin came up to me, one of the guys organizing the event. Do you know Olin Clausen? Yes. Yeah. I made yeah. him out there. Okay. okay. Yeah. So Olin came up to me. He's like, Hey, I signed you up for the, for the, um, the final event. And I was like, what? I'm like, I don't have any gear here. I don't have nothing, dude. Like I just got my ball cap oh. and my shorts basically. <laughs> He's like, God, too bad. Figure it out. I signed you up. And I, I'm like, well, what's the event? He's like, you got to do this, this, and this. And I'm like, well, I don't have climbing gear. Like, I don't I got nothing. He's like, figure it out. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So I had, I had to borrow boots. I had to borrow climbing gear. I had to borrow tools, hard hat, everything. I literally just got it together right before the event started. And, and they're like, yep, you're climbing. I'm like, oh, you idiot. So <laughs> first time I met you, you were my pole partner for the event. And I think we actually crushed it pretty good on that event. We did. I think we got a shorthanded there at the end or we walked out with the buckles. But yeah, uh, that was a cool event being thrown together like that. Yeah. I didn't realize you didn't have anything. So, so you did great. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, no, that was fun. I, I kind of like pressure situations like that anyway. So, um, uh, just come up with it on the fly. It's pretty much just like line work is most of the time anyways, just get it together get up there and get her done. So is, uh, That's is, cool. is rodeo something that you like to do often or was that a kind of uh, a first time thing? No, no, no. So, uh, this will, so I've been competing since I got in the trade back in 1993. Uh, this year's 30 years for me in line work. Wow. Um, it'll be my 22nd time competing out the international. So, Dang. Yeah. 22 yeah. times? 22 times, yeah. I, I really enjoy it and keeps me young at heart, I guess. But <laughs> Were, you there? The bone. Were you there last year? Yes, sir. Sweet. Yep. I was there too. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, they, I was supposed to go this year as well, but I ended up booking a trip to a, it's a bucket list trip for me, a trip to Everest base camp. So oh. I'm heading to Everest, uh, right at the same time the rodeo is happening. So yeah, it's going to be fun. Yeah. You got to take care of them bucket list things for sure. Yeah. I always had hopes and dreams of climbing the biggest mountains in the world when I was like a kid. But as soon as I had kids of my own, I kind of put that on the back burner. It felt a little too selfish to travel around the world and potentially die on a mountain somewhere. So, oh, I at least want to get to the bottom of it. And I don't know, want to walk through the Himalaya and see, see those three tall mountains there. So. Wow. I can't even imagine go out to Colorado elk hunting every year. And man, it just, as soon as you get out of the truck, it takes your breath away. I can't imagine 
that altitude, what that's going to do to you. Yeah, I know. I'm kind of scared of that actually. There's some pills, uh, there's some pills you can take for like for the oxygen deprivation or whatever. And, uh, mm-hmm. we're going to kind of take our time and just, it's only base camp. So it's not like, it's not like crazy, crazy altitude. It's still pretty high, <laughs> but it's <laughs> not, it's not like, I think it's like 17,000, 17 or 18,000 feet. So it's That's getting up there, but it's not the 29,000 feet of Everest. <laughs> And we're going to take our time. We're going to do it in like a bit of a progression. We're going to, uh, it's 130 kilometers. So for anyone that doesn't know, it's kind of, kind of cool. You fly into Kathmandu and then you fly from Kathmandu into Lukla. And I don't know if you've ever seen that little tiny, there's a tiny runway, uh, right in the oh. mountains. You see them on Instagram posts sometimes yeah. where the airplanes land on this little short runway and they take off and they like disappear down under the cliff and then like. So you fly into Lukla and then you walk about 130 kilometers and there's a few, there's a few stops along the way, tea houses and stuff that you stay at. So you split, the, oh, wow. you split it up over about seven days. That's cool. Yeah, man. So enough about me. Um, let's talk about you. Let's talk about where you, where you come from, where you live right now. Okay. Um, I grew up in central Illinois and, uh, right now I'm currently in the Southern part of the state, right? at the very bottom, uh, just right outside of Kentucky, basically. i uh, been down here approximately nine years now. Love it. Uh, down the hills and hollers, I say. I grew up in a flat country of corn and beans, and down here, God's country, I call it. What's it What's it like? Describe it a little bit for someone. I've only been to, like, I was in, uh, I was in Indiana there, flew into Kentucky, into Indiana for the, for the rodeo, but, like, minimal time spent in that area. Okay, so we have a lot of uh, rural, um, well, I say rural, but it's through uh, cliff areas, trees, um, which makes the work exciting. You know, you never know what you're going to get into um, because big tree falls down, you're not getting to it other than, you know, minimal gear and some gators or whatever you got to get back in. Yeah. You know, watch out for the snakes and, and all that too. So, what do you never got, know what you're going to get in. What are you going for snakes? Um, <laughs> sticks. <laughs> no, we'll use, uh, wear gators, you know, uh, leg gators get back in there. But what do you mean for snakes? Yeah. Uh, copper, copper heads, a lot of copper heads okay. here. I have rattlers too. But. There, uh, there's a bit of a rattler population in my area here. It's really weird. I live in, uh, Kelowna, British Columbia, Canada, and it's like a kind of a semi dry desert area. And the rattlesnakes are starting to pop up a little bit more frequently in this area so i don't like snakes much <laughs> well, no i i don't mind them as well as i can see them but the rattlers at least give you a warning the copper yeah. did they're tough yeah, yeah. Have, have you come across them a bunch like working yeah i just killed a couple in my backyard here about a week ago so you know a couple i got them with the mower you know but didn't see them until i saw the pieces lying there so but they were sizable dang dude um, what did your parents do growing up? Uh, my dad was a teacher, mom, stay at home mom. Uh, so yeah, we, uh, back then teachers, well, they still don't make a whole lot, not what they deserve to make, but, uh, dad definitely did. So we struggled. So I've had a job since I was 11 years old, you know, just so we, we all did, you know, all of us kids had to work and yeah. help out or right? just the way you grew up. What did, uh, how did you find line work? Like it's somebody uh, that- yeah, it was a blessing and an accident. Um, so I tried to put myself through college as a colorblind art major. So I was going to make zero money. Uh, that was not going to work. Ended up having to move back home. Um, my brother-in-law, ex-brother-in-law now, he is a tree trimmer. And, and he took me to the hall to sign up to be a tree trimmer. And on the way there, we're about five minutes from the union hall. And he's like, hey, why don't you be a lineman? I'm like, what's a lineman? You know, I had no no idea and he's like oh they climb them big power poles work on the those electric lines i'm like why would i want to do something like that he's like, well, it's a good job better job security you know you get that ticket you can go anywhere you want in the world basically and he said you know every day's new you know you never know what you're going to be doing i'm like i'll sign up for it and uh went through the interview process got put on a list i think i was 13th on the list and i sat there for almost a year um 
trying to get into Albat, and they were getting ready to re-interview everybody. And luckily, there was enough people that didn't take their their chance and go. So I was the last person that got to go, or I wouldn't have never got in. Wow. So, yeah, first uh, went out as a groundman for about a week and a half before I went to climbing school. Never seen anybody put on a set of hooks, climb a pole or anything. The first person I seen climb a pole was the apprentice next to me at climbing school. So, Dude, yeah, was, uh, walk yeah. me through that experience. I know that was a little while ago, but like, yeah, it's uh, it's been a long time ago. But yeah, it's just one of them things that you know I got out there, and so that first week and a half just being a groundman we just put down anchors ran down guys uh they actually let me go in a bucket and string some ropes in on a 69 line that they were building um so i just got a just a basic understanding of what line work could be but i mean there was just something intriguing about it I'm like, man this is cool i'm i'm gonna do this i don't care what it's gonna take or what i gotta do i'm gonna get through this thing and do it so when that instructor at uh, climate school handed me some set of hooks and i kind of looked at him with that uh what do i do with these things and he's like are you serious you know and i'm like ah so he, she goes i'm gonna show you one time put them on my feet you know and and that was it you know so huh yeah, it was, you're a pretty good climber from what i remember at the rodeo were you was it something that came natural to you like um you know i mean i'd always deer hunted and wasn't afraid of heights so i thought but still you know you back then back in the day you free climbed everything and, uh you know i mean we even free climbed 120 foot poles it'd still give you a gut check you know when you go running up because i mean actually back in the day it was a lot faster and a lot quicker but uh, you kind of learn things along the way and techniques and tricks but um natural i don't know um, it was just something that I, I knew, knew I had to do that, uh, and it was enjoyable. You know, I, I liked it then I still love climb poles. So, um, we do it not as near as much as what we used to, but, yeah. uh, we're trying to keep in shape for the rodeo and stuff, uh, Heck yeah. and training the apprentices that, that keeps me going. So what's something that, um, I talk about, uh, some of my experiences with climbing quite a bit and, how like when I was younger, I talk about, um, just skin in the pole, like coming down like super fast, four or five steps and you're at the bottom and throw your belt over your shoulder. And, and I talk about this one quite a bit, but this, uh, this older guy, he, he was running backhoe and he stopped the hoe, shut it off. And he just looked at me as I got off the bottom of the pole and he's like, you're a fucking idiot. He said, <laughs> and I was like, why, what do you, what did I do? <laughs> I thought I was pretty good. <laughs> He's like, if you keep coming down the pole like that, you're not going to have knees left by the time you're my age. And I was like, whatever. <laughs> like, I feel great. There's no way. Um, what's some advice now climbing through 30 years of a career that you'd give your 18, 19, 20 year old self what kind of advice would you give for that person starting climbing now? Oh man, it's so tough because just the climbing techniques have changed. You know, they teach you at climbing school back then when you're free climbing and keep your butt out, you know, knees locked, butt out. Well, I don't know that I ever really lock a knee and I've never had any trouble with my knees, you know, thank God for that. Uh, Cause I've, I was always told the same thing, you know, I've always been one just zoom, come down and, get on to the next one, you know, and, um, I don't know, I get, uh, told a lot that everything's a race for you and it kind of is, you know, I mean, it's, it, it makes things enjoyable. Yeah. Um, but all oh, proper technique, especially with the fall restraints they had now, you know, it's, you use it properly. It's going to catch you. Um, now I've had some pretty bad falls back in the day from free climbing where I didn't have that, that, uh, safety net, I guess you would call it. Um, just, you know, bad poles, shallows out on you and there you go, you know, eating splinters and that kind of thing. So, you know, now you just kind of eat your pride a little bit and get back in and go. What's, uh, you mentioned competition and I was always the same way, uh, going through line work, like every day, everything you do is, is competition. I find like there's two sort, there's two kinds of people. There's people who like to compete and then there's 
the guy the guys that just don't care like they're just one speed they don't care they just that's their speed um what do you think competition's good for line work and what's your thoughts on the rodeo side of things and is that good for line work talk about that a little bit sure absolutely um i think competition's good at work in a friendly way you know i mean you're looking down at the guy on the next pull down or whatever and i mean there's a little pride factor there should be a little pride factor in doing a quality job but doing it well doing it quick you know i mean um it's always been something that was instilled to me by my father you know and i try to instill that in the apprentices that i train too you know you know take some pride in your take some pride in yourself and it just makes you a better person i believe in all aspects um as far as the rodeos man that's been a huge help for me and some apprentices that i've had that have struggled in line work for one it makes you look at things differently um you have to think on your feet a lot because well, i mean you know that uh, some of the mystery events you're given a task right there before you go just like the one we had we had to try to figure it out real fast who's going to do what who thinks they can do what better you know uh, but things happen during that time too and you gotta think on the fly because that clock is ticking you know um plus it yeah i'm 53 years old i still compete i can still you know there's still there's always somebody better and faster but i still on certain days i can hold my own you know or i try to at least and you know you have good days and bad days but uh um but it keeps me in shape you know helps me out when i'm out in the field just because obviously we don't with all the bucket trucks and everything we don't climb like we did back in the day when we were three in a line truck or you know you had three crews and one bucket between those three crews and um, but now we still have a lot of poles and private right away so you know i'm not going to be the guy that's going to shy away from climbing that pole when it's needed because it has to be done you know somebody's got to do it so you know i'm not, i want to be i want to make sure i'm ready to go you know especially if it's a emergency situation or um you know god forbid you got to help somebody down or rescue somebody i want to make sure i know what i'm doing in that case to not only get them down safely but to get myself out of that situation to get back to my family yeah yeah what is it that uh so why do you like to compete so much at rodeos <laughs> uh man that's a tough question i mean obviously you like the win but that's not what it's all about you know I, I go there to have a great time i meet people from all across the world just like meeting you you know um who'd have thought that day you know we'd have been talking now what three years later about that event you know um but uh there's people that you know i go can't see that's the only time i ever see them you know once a year but you know you you sit there and you catch up like you've known them your whole life and uh that's a good feeling you know plus it it opens incredible doors um i've got to i work with buckingham manufacturing on developing products i've got four or five products with them now we just came out with a new 6D uh, belt, uh, working with them on fall restraints. Nice. Uh, and they send me products to test all the time. You know, I never thought I'd do anything like that to put my input into the trade and try to make the trade better. You know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's cool all the way around. Yeah. 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 Um, that's, that's really cool. It's, it's very similar to like, to doing this. I don't work on the tools anymore um just kind of do this now and some mark and marketing but like still very involved with the industry and it's just what i love to do is just to have what like my fingerprint on the industry still right leave my mark on the industry and and bring people together and i i don't know it's very cool it's very cool what you can do nowadays so different um yeah. what's some advice uh, what's some advice for people? You obviously like 22 years going to ILR, competing at ILR, um, the international lineman rodeo. What's, what have you learned now? Again, same, similar question. What would you tell yourself 20 times ago, uh, about the rodeo and about, um, 
you know, gearing up for the, for the events. Let's go through it a little bit. Go through that a little bit. Okay, sure. Um, so when I first started competing, like I said, I was, you know, 23 years old when I got into it and, you know, I could run all day and just keep going and go a lot faster from point A to point B. But man, I'm like, golly, I'm faster than that guy. Why am I getting beat so bad? Well, it wasn't just the climbing aspect up and down. It was everything up there, you know? And, uh, so really look at what you're doing, um, why you're at that point. And that's why I tell the apprentices, you don't have to be the fastest by any means, you know, climbing up a pole and fast and, you know, semi-fast is only a second or two. It's not that big a difference. It's, you know, especially like in the hurt man rescue, getting your tools on. If a guy takes 45, 50 minutes, to get his tools on, I'm done, you know, with that. So, um, you know, you should be hitting that pole in 13 seconds, you know, tools on and around the pole and ready to go. You know, you can't make up that kind of time clock. There's no way. Uh, one thing I've done and learned is video. Um, mm -hmm. so I video a lot of my practices and I break them down and just like when I, you know, I was blessed to set some records in speed climb and hurt man in, you know, in my forties, uh, it took me that long to figure out what I was doing wrong and started doing some stuff right. And, uh, but the way I did that was I would break down the videos into like, um, getting on the pole, um, climbing from point A to point B, tying off the dummy, you know, and hurt man rescue, you know, just the different things. And even on the speed climb, um, getting on the pole, getting up there, breaking it down and seeing what my best splits were of those times. And I put it in my head that times that I didn't think were possible. I'm like, well, I'm doing it. I'm just not doing it all together. So I could see what my were and then i knew mentally that i could do it if i had a perfect run you know and those perfect runs were far between but you know i even amazed myself one day by shattering what i thought was even possible uh, on that but uh, i never could pull it off in competition but uh, you know i mean it was cool to do it that day it's amazing what like <laughs> that's really cool i like that like breaking it down into in compartmentalizing it into pieces and it's amazing how much time is in between those pieces. Like you just oh, said, like if you could, if you could just string it all together in one perfect run, you'll shatter what you even thought was possible. I like that. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, just even like the hurt man rescue setting up my tools. I used to have them kind of laid out where stuff wouldn't, uh, interfere with each other, but just that little half second from getting from here to there to there, you know, that really putting everything in a compact area where your men and mit, uh, movements were very minimal man it just sped everything up so fast is there any other little uh, little things like that that a, a person could look at uh, seek advice from anybody that's been sure. um, because like I said when I came up through I didn't really have anybody show me anything and I actually had people ask me and that's I have a YouTube channel um, and I post videos on there and it's not for bragging rights or anything like that. It's basically people want to see that stuff. So I'm, I, I don't have any secrets, you know, and if somebody else is going faster and I can learn. From yeah. They still got to They still got to do it. Right. <laughs> You're right. Exactly. Yeah. But if they're going faster, then, you know, it makes me want to go faster and try to figure it out. What am I doing wrong? How can I beat them? So yeah, uh, just seek advice from anybody that's knowledgeable, I guess. You know, there's good advice and bad advice. I say you can always say you can learn something from everyone. It's just some stuff you kind of want to put in the back of your brain and not use, you know. So. What's a question that you would ask yourself? Like, uh, like if you were somebody that's seeking advice from a guy like yourself who's been there 22 times, what's a question oh, that you would ask? Golly, that's a tough one there. Uh, Have you had that question in the past, like seeked out other people that had been there and Maybe what's, what's something you'd ask them? Uh, most people just want to know, you know, tools or techniques or setup. But as far as, uh, you can't beat competition for competition. If, if you want to succeed in it, if there's betting somebody, a uh, energy drink or anything, you know, um, like I said, competition 
just going out and doing it one thing but if you can go to a local competition if you got a buddy you know that you can try to beat him at anything beating yourself at anything and that's where the video comes in too because i mean if you just time it the whole thing you don't know what you're doing at all but you break that down and you can see it but you can't be competition for competition and uh that's the actually like that you said that i was instructing for a little while uh, a couple years at the lazy q ranch uh for quanta in texas there and um i remember the students i'm a i'm a decent climber and the students were always wanting to like race me right and i was like no no you know no and so finally this one kid i'm like fine let's fucking go let's race he was pretty good though like he was yeah and 20 years old <laughs> right like just fast and uh but like you said call that competition again because it had been a while since i'd even competed for anything <laughs> like but just having 30 or 40 guys standing around watching an instructor compete against a student like i, I lost too i lost by just a fraction the fucking oh. buck buck squeeze got me <laughs> oh. <laughs> i was whipping yeah it was no good but it was good though. Like it, he, he was jacked. He was pumped. Like it was so good. Um, I love competition. Yeah. It's so nerve wracking though. Like my heart was, this is stupid. It's the kids. Like it's the students and a couple <laughs> instructors, but I don't know, just that feeling of a bunch of people around watching you. And yeah, it's cool. I love, yeah. I love competition. Yeah, I, oh yeah. I tried to, uh, bet the apprentices, you know, all the time on stuff, me up on it. And, uh, boy, it's, uh, no matter what the bet is, I hate to lose it, you know, even though, yeah. you know, if they beat me, that's great. You know, uh, more power to them. I don't mind losing a fair fight, but I'm going to try to fight unfair if I can, you know? <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> um, talk about, uh, I want to, I don't want to leave this to the end, but to talk about yeah. the foundation you started. I want to I chat about that a little bit. This climbing, okay. climbing for kids, it's called. Yes, sir. So, um, three is 2020 or I'm sorry, 2021. Um, golly, I can't remember. Yeah. 2021, um, went out to the rodeo. It just got back, um, from COVID, uh, our company wasn't sending anybody. So, uh, just, this is one of them things where I met a buddy, uh, from Virginia and he was on working for another utility and um, it was just one of them things that, Hey, if we ever get the chance where my company's not sending anybody and yours isn't sending anybody, we'll just go out there on our own and compete and have a good time, you know? So, uh, we got us a groundman, um, uh, his, uh, Jay Leathers, uh, groundman from up in Northern Illinois and, uh, Justin Bettis out of Virginia. And, uh, we just threw a team together and it was my 20th time competing out there. And I'm like, you know, Hey guys, you care if we do something a little bit different and, you know, we'll just, we'll pay for everything on our own, but we're going to try to raise some money for St. Jude's Shoulder Hospital, and we'll just call our our team climbing for kids. And uh, man, it was uh, it was a success. That first year, we raised fifty five hundred dollars. Um, all went to St. Jude's. Um, golly, we almost won the whole stinking rodeo too. We did get a practice as a team at all. Um, we got uh, second in the speed climb. We got three uh three six places or two yeah three six play two six places third in our division and uh six overall and it was like golly we come so close to getting that name up there so many times you know um, just all them six places but we got it on stage a couple times of course we wore uh bright pink shirts and bright pink hard hats that day on our so everybody knew who we were because they're all looking at us like, you know, they could see the logo and everything. We wanted to stand out. Oh, yeah. Well, we wanted to stand out for yeah. people asking what this was about, you know. So then the next year, um, Amron, like the utility I worked for, they jumped on board with it. And uh, we ended up raising 45000 for St. Jude's Hospital. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and I don't know if you remember. Um, so you said you were out there last year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one of the most, a moment that, uh, so I've, I've been blessed to be on stage quite a few times out there, but, uh, this was by far my best memory of the international. So Juliana, Paul, uh, Kohler and his daughter, Juliana and his family were out there. Um, she was helped 
through St. Jude's and several other children's hospitals. She uh, had cancer, diagnosed in March. And uh, she, Paul, is a competitor, lineman and competitor out the road. And she always loved going out there. She was 10 years old, I think 10 years old. Um, she uh, loved going to the rodeo, was pretty far advanced. And uh, so I talked to the international. They helped her out, like driving around with a cart that day, letting her see the little competition. Um, Lanny from Lapco was huge help, um, helping to reach out to people. Uh, that she loved the trade, the shirts. So just all kinds of utilities and everything, donated shirts to her so she could go and trade. And then uh, she helped present the check that night on the stage for St. Jude's. And uh, it was a special moment, touched my heart beyond belief uh, and unfortunately um i guess about five weeks later she passed away um, yeah so which obviously uh, her family is so strong and we didn't know that she was that far advanced at that time you know and uh, right. it, it was pretty amazing um to be to be part of that and help help be part of that but so uh yeah so um this year we're doing the climate for kids again um, we're trying to, uh, we have even broader help with the international. So we're trying to spread it out across the country, um, to any, anybody basically that's wanting to help raise funds for St. Jude's Children's Hospital. Like I said, 100% of the proceeds go to St. Jude's, um, like Ameren, uh, this year they did a shirt fundraiser and, uh, all the proceeds like, well, you donate a certain amount, you get a free t-shirt through them, through the employees. And then uh, we're getting manufacturers involved. Um, hopefully, I'm going to try to do a big, um, trying to talk to the International out about getting a booth out there or a table and doing a big manufacturer's pile raffle, basically, uh, to where winner takes it all. Here's just stuff donated by manufacturers, and the winner of this raffle will take everything that's there, you know. Uh, just trying to, we're blessed, you know, in the careers we have. Yeah. And, you know, if you can't give something back, you know, leave, leave a little bit of footprint behind, you know, and that's like we talked about, you know, you're, you're doing with your podcast and I do with helping with the tools and the industry and trying to make it better. But, you know, it, it can even be bigger than that, you know, and I appreciate you letting us talk about this Absolutely. on here. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, that's a, honestly what it's for as well is it's like whatever sort of a voice or platform this is it's it's just for the people in the industry and in the trade that's why i started it in the beginning was just to share our stories because i was no good at writing so i, I can't i read too slow oh <laughs> But uh this was a good modern way to do it was just you know start a podcast so um but yeah it's that's such a cool thing that you're doing. I'm, I'll definitely uh, promote it as much as I can. I got a few ideas of how I can share this to some pretty influential people, and um, yeah, hopefully we can we can help you out that way. How do people, uh, anybody that's like listening that wants to help with this, like where do they go to donate or um, that sort of thing? Okay, so we have a uh, which it's a QR code that I have that scans to 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 the side, but they can also go to uh, we have an email, especially if somebody's interested in trying to start their own fundraiser to go along with this. Um, like I said anybody can uh, start up their climbing for kids, but it, it will just go to a one main tally uh, for a presentation, check presentation out at the international. There, there been a big help in this, uh, but the uh, the email is uh, climbing for kids at amarin dot com. There's no G in that. So it's C-L-I-M-B-I-N-F-O-R-K-I-D-S at Ameren, A-M-E-R-E-N dot com. And that'll, uh, there's myself and Paul and a couple uh, people at Ameren have access to that email so we can answer any questions directly. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, when we're done with this as well, uh, send me that QR code and I'll make sure I put it on the social media posts oh, and, and that sort of thing. So yeah, heck yeah. That's a, 
that's a really cool thing, man. And yeah, I wish you the best of success with that. That's, that's something special when you get the opportunity to give back to people. And I've had, um, I've worked with, uh, quite a few veterans, uh, through the veteran electrical entry program or the VEEP program. And, uh, it's just, it's so neat because I've, they're, they're guys that have reached out like well on, well in active duty still like overseas, literally, Hey, Ryan just found your TikTok. This sounds like a really cool opportunity. Is it even real? And I'm, you know, I just start in the DMS. I'm like, yeah, this, it's super real. It's legit. It's, you don't have to use your GI bill, nothing like it's, it's legit. And they're like, wow, what do I need? To, you know? And then you start kind of coaching them through what they need to know to get in. Like, they're like, this industry sounds like it's really cool. Yeah. I'd been able to coach them through it and get them into line work, like right after they exit active duty into, you know, attempting line work and get them, you know, free tools, training at the lazy queue. It's a 15 week training course, pre-apprenticeship course guaranteed job with a quanta company and you know direct entry or direct uh, interview anyway to the ibw district of their choice like it's just like it's such a great program and i've been able to see them through that now and a couple of them are linemen now and it's just like it's completely changed their life like they had no idea what they were going to do after service it was their biggest stress in their life was what am i going to do when i join the civilian world i have no idea and now they're in this career that it's, it's got a lot of similarities and, a, a, you know, a lot of things that really work well together, lie work and, you know, in the military. So it's been super awesome to see, you know, see their families now thriving and they're thriving. It's just like, a, it's a cool feeling when well, you can like, when you can give back to people, that's pretty neat. Sure. Yeah. I've seen some of your stuff on that and that is cool at what you do. And that's neat. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a big effort by a lot of people. So it's really cool also to see the different organizations kind of come together for a bigger cause too. And I'm sure that you've noticed that it's like usually organizations that compete against each other, whether it's competing at the ILR or competing for work and money when it's a meaningful cause like this, it really brings them together and they go, okay, well we can put aside any differences or we can put aside competition because the cause is bigger than any of that. You know, when you can help a little kid out that's going through struggles like that, that's right. Even to give them an experience like she had being at the rodeo and being up on stage and helping with that. Like that's man. That's just so special. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. It, it, it was a it was a moment that I will cherish forever. Absolutely. And I tell you what, um, just the the blessings I've had along the way of the stories of just wearing the climate for kids shirt. You know, um, the stories I've heard from people. Um, I stand in line and talking to a guy. And he's like, "Hey, you're, you know, you Clemson 1993." I'm like, "Yeah, I do the videos on there and." He's like, man, I, you know, I've been watching him and learning from him and everything. And, and he's like, what's that sitting with the shirt? You know, I got talking. He's like, man, I had cancer, you know, and, and it's just, it brings up and he's, you know, well, I ended up getting third out there last year, you know, and it was just, it was neat just bring it, you know, but just all the stories you hear, uh, people open up to you about that. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. It's, it's been gift for sure. Totally. Um, what kind of work, uh, have you done or what do you, what do you like to do? Have you stayed in like the distribution realm or have you done transmission or what's like your, what's, what's your specialty? If you had to pick one, what do you like to do? Man, I, I like it all. So, uh, I'm a crew foreman, I tried the one man truck for about a year and a half and that's just not for me. Um, I like being out there working, being in my tools, um, it's tough to be, you know, dead 69 work where you're just setting and running and gunning and, you know, or even a distribution rebuild where, you know, you can just run through there and do some stuff. But I mean, I like gloving and I like easement. I love easement work. You know, I'm one of them weird guys that likes to be standing up or on a pole and doing that kind of stuff. Um, but I do, you know, give me a challenge. You know, I love storms. 
You know, I absolutely love Storm, so you never know what you're going to get. Uh, we actually, we work a ton of overtime here, and we do everything. We used to do, I should say, we used to do everything. Um, they kind of took the 100 kV and above from us. Um, we used to even do 345 tower maintenance. It was all dead, you know, but we did some back in the day. Yeah. Um, but we do 100, 138 rebuilds, H structures. We used to do those. Uh, now it's, uh, like I said, 100 kV and below. So we go into work. We have our standard weekly um, jobs that we do. But obviously emergency work takes precedence. So every day you go in, you never know what you're going to get into. You know, on especially not the phone rings. And, and it rings a lot. <laughs> it rings a lot down here. So, which is nice. I, I love it. What do you see mostly for emergency type work? <sighs> Golly, I wish we'd get away from the drunks hitting poles. But, uh, you know, between that and there's a lot of bad underground, just dated underground. Um, but we are, we are in an area that's uh, a lot of stuff running through trees. So, you know, it'd be a nice calm day. An old tree falls through the line. You just never know. Um, so when I fall, you just don't know what you're going to get. But, uh, yeah, we do get a lot of, a lot of tree damage. I was talking to a uh, uh, lineman from New Zealand, Jimmy Moranis, uh, a couple nights ago, and uh, we were talking about storm work and just how cool of an experience it can be. I worked a couple hurricanes on the East Coast, and I remember fly into Connecticut, get going, you know, like throw the orange lights on that bucket truck, throw the orange flashy lights on, and it's like an all access pass to wherever you want to go. Like it's, you know, you're almost like welcomed. Like people see you coming down the driveway and it's like, Hey, it's over here. Come. And you just get to like, it's so neat where you get to go and, and what you get to see that you just like, you'd never see, like you'd never, especially in a, you know, a place like Connecticut, just super old properties and old fences and buildings. And just like, that's where we first landed on the show, like, you know, first, first landed in Connecticut and that the, along the East coast. So, you know, I just, I thought it was really cool coming from British Columbia, the opposite coast where it's pretty young and there's not much over here. So you get to go there and just like throw those orange beacons on and it's on all access pass into wherever you want to drive into and you just get to see some really cool stuff. Oh yeah. So we went to Connecticut a couple of years ago on hurricane. And, uh, it was completely all rural and we go to this little town and we ask them about a Julie and are like, yeah, there's water through here somewhere. And we're like, you don't have any way to locate it. And he's like, no, he said, it's still in, uh, wooden pipes. And I was like, wooden pipes. He's like, yeah, we still have, we still have some in stock that we replace. He said, we're trying to replace it, but he says, yeah, it still has wooden water pipes through here. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. That's so, so uh, Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a crazy thought, you know, but uh, you just never know what you're going to run into. Especially like uh, s septic systems or something too, like you know, <laughs> old wooden, <laughs> wooden shitty yeah. septic systems you drive on top of or something. <laughs> or, or yeah, I've seen a truck go into one before. That's not a, not a good sight. As a foreman, uh, ask you a couple of leadership questions and um, as a foreman, What's some complexities or, you know, how you deal with like crew dynamics and things like that? Oh, well, I mean, definitely personalities can, can play a big role. Um, very fortunate though. We've got a great group of guys, you know, everybody has a bad day. Sure. And sometimes you just kind of got to walk away from that and let it go. And uh, but sometimes you got to have a little discussion to, you know, that, Hey, you don't need to, bring everything into work you know uh, we all have bad days we don't have to bring all that you know there and just cause a big stink but uh no i'd say that's the biggest hurdle uh but as far as we, we uh we do have a lot of good hands where i work makes a big difference and uh, like i said we work a lot of overtime so that revolving list on there you get mixed and matched uh, a lot on that and uh you know, and yeah, you know, I'm the oldest guy in the crew room and senior foreman, but I'm not always foreman either, you know? So, um, you know, I'll listen to anybody who's got a, a good word of advice or a better way to do something. I'm a game for it, you know? And 
some people get things stuck in their head and that's just the way it's got to be, you know? So sometimes you roll with it and sometimes it's like, oh no, we're going to, we're going to do it like this, you know, but uh, it, it makes some interesting dynamics sometimes. What's a, uh, um, crew chemistry. How important is crew chemistry and how do you build chemistry if you can? Uh, man, chemistry could be pretty big. I mean, you, you, I'm with the crew more than I'm with my family, you know, and, uh, and those crews change, but you learn so much about everybody there, you know, and you got, I think you have to, because I trust, you know, you're, you're trusting your brother with your life. And, you know, if, you know, you want to make sure that you send down the next pole on the switch, that a switch gets opened up and, you know, and they're not doing something else or they got their mind somewhere else. So you learn, you get to know the people to learn how to read them for that day, especially on a forum, because, uh, you know, like I said, everybody's got a bad day. So sometimes you don't send that person down there just because their mind's somewhere else, you know, and, uh, you all forgot to be willing to step back yourself because, and realize when you have that bad day, but, uh, chemistry is huge. I think just, uh, man, I don't even know really, uh, like I said, they're, they're, your, they're your family, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's wild how much time you actually spend with them. They say, if you want to really get to know somebody, uh, travel with them. And I understand, sure. I understand that from a lineman's perspective, just because like when you travel with somebody, you're around them through, you know, when they're tired, when they're hungry, like th those are the times that you really get to know people. And that's the same thing for line work. Like <laughs> when you're tired, exhausted, hungry, you know, all these, you've been working multiple days in a row, going through bad shit at home. Like you get the whole fullness of it. It's not like an office job where, you know, you can avoid Sally because she sits alone in a cubicle or in an office. If she's grumpy that day, you can avoid her or Dawn or somebody, you know, it's like, I'll just stay away. So I'll stay away from him today. You don't get that luxury on a crew, on a line crew. It's like, no, you're going to go. It's the complete opposite. It's like, imagine going and standing in Sally's cubicle with her all day long, you know, <laughs> right. or just sitting there beside her. Like, here, here's the pencil. I need a pencil. Here's the pencil. You know, like. I can't, I, people can't grasp it and it's, uh, it's different. It's definitely a different sort of work. Oh yeah. You definitely have to have a sense of humor for sure. Cause you're, somebody's having a bad day. You're down there in a hole, you know, slicing underground with them for a little while. And, you know, things can get pretty rough at times, but, um, no, you, you gotta have a sense of humor to make the days go, especially when you're working 20 plus hours a day, yeah. you know? The old swamp butt gets going and you know your feet are hurting from your boots and yeah you know, your clothes are stinking your armpits are hurting and all you want to do is get in the shower but the shower is still a few hours away you know yeah 100 percent. what's a practical way for a leader to not use fear uh but still motivate their team well i'm at we so safeties are I mean, we're going for safety with number one, you know, uh, back in the day it was, we were bidding jobs on construction. When I worked construction doing coming up through your apprenticeship, it was, uh, the companies were bidding jobs and it was running gun all day long, you know, and you're, you're, it was production, 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 and try not to get hurt in the meantime, you know, now, you know, luckily the industry standards change where, you know, they push safety first still get be productive get out there so i don't know that you have to push any type of fear or anything like that you know i mean uh, like i said we got a good group of guys that are willing to jump in and work and uh you know it's probably quite the opposite a lot of times that uh, you're kind of fighting to get there first so you can get in and get in there to get to the work you know that's good to hear because it's not it's not necessarily the case everywhere um, definitely think it, maybe it was more an old school mentality. It's uh, you know, rule by fear, just, you know, you're going to listen to everything I have to say, because I'm the guy who's been here doing it the longest and, you know, whatever, whatever the, the method is, but 
it just doesn't seem to be the way to motivate people these days. So I'm always curious what's, you know, what, what tactics people are using to help motivate their teams to do stuff. Yeah. So I came up through the apprenticeship. A lot of times I didn't really have a journeyman. Um, I was just with a, usually a lesser step apprentice and I was kind of the guy that had to show him and I had a foreman kind of give me the basics of this is what we're doing now kind of figure out kind of thing. And I had some really good foremen that would challenge me mentally, you know, on what do you think about this? And I try to explain where I thought I could do something a little bit better possibly. Or like, okay, well, I'm hoping you would say that and uh, kind of develop that. I think with the apprentices, um, I'm not a yeller and a screamer. If I'm yelling at you, then, you know, watch out because you're doing something wrong. You know, you're, you're going to get hurt or get somebody hurt. Um, I just, I wasn't brought up. I seen it. I seen guys just get yelled at, beat down, screamed at. And I don't think anybody, you know, treat a man like a man. Don't treat him like a dog. You know, I don't, I don't think that's the way anybody should learn because then they're going to try to teach somebody else that way, you know. What are you seeing with young people that uh, you could give them for advice uh, getting into this industry or this trade? Seeing the way seeing the way it has changed over the years, what's something that you tell them now? Don't run out and buy a big monster truck right in your first paycheck. <laughs> Everyone wants to. So they still don't, they're still not going to listen to you. Though. <laughs> I don't know, but every one of them wants to go buy a big wheel truck, you know. <laughs> every single student, every single student that I taught, yeah. we tell them that for five months. And they're like, yeah, no, I got it. I got it. The first check they got, they went out, oh, I'm going to go on the road. They bought a trailer and a truck. And I'm just right. like, you're, you just ruined yeah. yourself. Yeah. Yeah. You just ruined some money. And I got yeah. Save some money, put away for a rainy day because they come. You never know what life's going to throw at you. You know, you're blessed in a great job now, but, you know, I've, I've been fortunate. I've seen sustained some pretty serious injuries over my career, but been uh, told a couple times I never do line work again, but been able to come back from those. And, you know, not everybody has that chance. You know, we're in a dangerous career and anything can happen. You know, it doesn't have to just be something on the pole. I mean, the car is driving down the street or worse than about anything. I worked with a guy in South Texas um, on a bare hand job uh, for a few months. And then a few months later, after we left that job, he was just working with his crew um, off the side of the road, quite a ways off the side of like a kind of like a freeway. And car just went off the road through three of them, just like that. Like they were just standing at the back of the truck. They were probably. 50 yards from the road even like it wasn't and just truck came or a car came wailing off the off the road and went right through three of them it's crazy just like that so yeah you good point um what uh sort of incidences did you have or like accidents or injuries or whatever you're saying uh i had my spine fused um 20 years ago um and then I had a, uh, another back surgery. I went paralyzed for three days. Um, I mean, full fledged paralyzed from waist down, um, uh, vertebrae, uh, uh, herniated. And it's basically like somebody just pushed completely on that, on your nerve. And I could, I mean, I couldn't do anything. It's right during the midst of COVID, uh, life took me to the hospital. They pumped me up with drugs. They didn't touch it, you know, but luckily they got me in and, uh, walked out of the surgery you know two hours after surgery I walked out of the hospital that was a bad deal shattered i was doing a apprentice training yeah of what not to do i guess um just went up to hang the dummy at 12 feet uh, for a hurt man rescue and uh when i flipped the poles really chewed up and it's a little misty out but i slipped instead of eating a bunch of splinters i was like oh, i'm just going you know street climbing i was like i'll just eat my pride here because i was kind of in an awkward position, just went to take a big step down. And, uh, when I did my heel went into a hole and my left leg, I shattered, uh, my tibia and fibula. They actually came through my boot, uh, both bones came through my boot. And, uh, you know, I'm 
sitting there laying on the table, getting ready to go in for surgery. And doctor's like, you know, Hey, you know, this is a pretty bad injury. I'm like, yeah, yeah. It came through my boot. And he got this real straight face. He's like, most likely you're going to lose your leg. You know, you have no circulation down there. And it went through an old dirty boot. You know, we're going to try to clean up, do what we can. But he said, I'm telling you right now, it's, you know, you have two options. One's start taking muscles from other parts of your body because the infection's probably already set in. And I'm like, well, don't do that. And he's like, well, the other option is, I said, I know what the other option is, but just do what you can do. And we'll go from there, you know, I'll make it work. But uh, six months later, I was back to work and competing at the rodeo again. So, uh, positive. Yeah. Okay. A couple things that I want to unpack there. Um, <laughs> what's, what, what does it feel like when you lose, like, what does it feel like in your head when you lose the ability to move your legs? Uh, oh, geez. Because uh, the reason I ask that, because I think that's important for people to understand to not do stupid stuff. <laughs> not that you're okay. doing stupid well, stuff, but, no. you know, like. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, um, so I work out quite a bit. Uh, most mornings I get up 445, come downstairs to the basement and work out. And I was training for a Murph. So all I was doing was push-ups, pull-ups, and air squats. No weight or anything. And But I did lift. And I, so when I had my spinal surgery, spinal fusion, 20 years prior, they looked at that next level, and it was herniated. But they said they didn't want to do anything on it. And I thought, great. Well, I mean, I felt strong as a bull. I'll do whatever I want. You know, that was a, one of the deals two or six months after my spinal fusion. I came back to work for release. And, you know, I mean, it ached for quite a few years, but... You know, as far as I could do whatever I want, still can. Well, I was doing the air squat that morning, and uh, all of a sudden I thought felt something pop in my back, and I thought I just pulled a muscle. So I'll go upstairs, and uh, within a few hours, I mean, I was hurting bad by well eight o'clock that night, or so. I mean, I I was done. I couldn't do anything. Finally, my wife took me in the hospital. You know, she had to wheel me into a wheel, put you know, called her mom, dad, got a wheelchair. We got loaded up in the car, drove into the hospital. They pumped me full of drugs. And like I said, it was right at the height of COVID. And they're like, well, there's nothing we can do with you, but we can't keep you here. So they, ah, they're like, it's too dangerous. You know, I'm it's too dangerous to stay here because of COVID. And then yeah. go home, see what you can do. Well, got into the doctor um, two days later. And he's like, go to the ER right now. He says, you've got massive herniation of that disc. And it's put, he says, you probably have permanent damage. And, uh, he said, but we'll try to mitigate what we can. And, uh, he says, they're not going to take you, but just take him to the ER and get him in there and I'll start making phone calls. And they got emergency surgery on me. But yeah, I mean, it was, it was bad. I literally could not stand at all, you know, and you're thinking, you know, you're not thinking of your, you're hurting, but it's like the thoughts are run to your head. Like, you know, I've got family to take care of, you know, I can't be like this, you know? I can't be down. I gotta, gotta keep going. You know, something's got to give here. But there was just nothing. There's nothing I could do. I was at the mercy of that. You know, they, after, you, was, after you heal from this, how do you uh, how do you approach lifting and working out? Is it all? It's all good now from the surgery. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, it is. Yeah. So you know, obviously, I took a little while. Um, you know, they don't want you doing much afterwards, just walk in and building your muscles back up and everything, which it was just, uh, so when I had the spinal fusion, um, I had 62 staples in my back. I mean, they opened me wide. That was, like I said, 20 years ago. So it was a major surgery back then. Not that it's not now, but you know, especially back then. They, yeah, absolutely. Much now, yeah. <laughs> now, you know, they went in there as a laminectomy, disectomy on this level. So it was a one inch incision and then, no stitches they just taped it up and glued it you know uh it was crazy the difference of modern medicine from that's from amazing back. Yeah. yeah so uh, some tape <laughs> some tape to 62 stitches uh damn. yeah yeah the staples yeah there were so uh and you can feel, feel every one of them things coming out too because yeah here it was rough it looked like a zipper going up down my back what was your approach to getting better after you broke your tibia and fibula? Um, 
uh, not what the doctor wanted. <laughs> so I was supposed to take it easy, which I did. You know, I mean, I, you kind of got to, you have to have that will in yourself and trust, trust the doctor, listen to the doctor, but also trust your own body and have that desire to get better. I think that's a lot of it is just that you got to have that spirit in you that you're going to get better. He told me at that time it'd be a year and a half uh, before I even took an office job and I would never climb a pole again. Uh, Challenge accepted. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, you know, he's like, I, I hear from these people, you know, you set these records and stuff and, you know, you, whatever. He says, but you're done. He says, get that out of your head. So uh, I was, it happened at a training deal, but it wasn't work comp. It was all my own. So I had to use my own sick leave and I got within four hours of running out of sick leave. So I talked my doctor into letting me come back to work as long as I didn't climb. And two weeks later I competed out the international, but I hadn't been on a pole since then. And, uh, that was, uh, it was a gut check that morning. I, I'm not going to lie. You know, uh, my buddy, we got, uh, red tagged for a mystery event. And the first event was laying out and changing out jumpers on a 10 foot arm. And yeah, he's like, so which, which side do you want to do first? I'm like, let's go up on the bad leg. I'm gonna lay out on the bad leg. And if I make it through that one, well, we're good, you know? And, uh, we actually ended up where red tag, we got third place in that event Helped all day and got third place in that. But when I come down, it was like 40 degrees that morning and I walk out of that bent, I'm just pouring down sweat. And my wife's like, oh my God, you're white. And she goes, are you okay? I'm like, I just need to sit down for a minute. And, <laughs> I just yeah, got to recover. So, <laughs> you know, yeah. I, mean, I mean, mentally, because I mean, it was like, yeah. you know, the whole time prior to that, I'm thinking, you know, can I do this? Can I do it? I need to go climb a pole and see. And I'm like, oh man, I don't, I don't want to do that. You know, I'm not supposed to be climbing, but I'm just going to wing it, you know? And uh, I did. And well, we ended up, uh, so we ended up, got third place in that event, second place in the speed climb, and uh, placed in another event in the Hurt Mountain. I think it was like fourth or fifth. We got second overall. And I come back to my doctor, and he's like, hey, how are you doing? You're walking good. I'm like, man, I'm doing great. And he's like, well, you're not climbing, are you? I was like, well, this is like two weeks after the road. I'm like, we just took second place. And he's like, what? <laughs> so he was not very happy. Well, my, I've come to find out my leg wasn't even completely healed yet. The bones, because I have a and almost an inch of cadaver bone in there. Okay. And that cadaver bone hasn't even, hadn't even healed up at that time. So basically I was just call, climbing on the metal, uh, the two plates and the 13 screws in my leg. And but I had no idea, you know, so, but it worked. Dude. Yeah. Iron man. That's why <laughs> they put some special stuff in there. <laughs> oh. Dude. Oh, that's crazy. Um, all right, Jay, I've had you for an hour. I got a few uh, a few more questions for you. These are uh, something I've been just kind of asking every guest. It's just, it's just kind of light. It's uh, finish my sentence. So I just ask you a question, a sentence. And... My wife doesn't do me. <laughs> <They're> just, uh... <laughs> oh, these are easy. Uh, okay. If I wasn't a lineman, I would be. Oh, man professional hunter or a home builder i guess we uh my wife and i have remodeled we've been married 12 how 12 years and we've done like 15 homes um but man i love hunting too you know i love being in the outdoors and if i could uh, elk hunt and mule deer hunt for a living golly i don't know i i've been blessed with line work though I, it was a career that i had no idea but i don't know now what I do without it, mm -hmm. honestly, without yeah. hunting. Well, without line, without line, without line work. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, it was, it was something I got into that I had no idea yeah. what it was, but now that I'm in it, I, I really don't know career wise day to day what I would enjoy more. It's a lot easier to make a living being a hunter these days than it was 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Just get on, get on social media, build a following doing it, and you can make a career out of it. <laughs> That's really cool, though. 
I'd actually like, I'd love to have you back on the show just to talk about the house stuff. And, uh, um, I'm super interested in that. I've done a few renovations and builds and stuff myself. So I'd be, I'd be super curious to get into that with you one of these days and the hunting as well. Might have to do, might have to do a round two. There you go. Anytime. All right. Um, okay. What's the most valuable tool in alignments kit? And I'd like to say your hooks, you know, um, you got to learn if you can learn to do the stuff out of your tools, you can do anything out of a bucket, you know, but if you can do stuff out of your tools, well, then you, you can be a leader, you can be a trainer, you can be somebody that people look up to as far as, um, looking for answers on a difficult project because if you can do stuff out of your tools, I mean, you just learn so many different techniques on rigging and just, cause just some positions and stuff, you just, you, it's not natural, you know? So you're putting yourself in awkward positions where you can't just muscle it out. You know, you, you, you gotta, you gotta know what you're doing, you know? So technically I guess your brain's your main thing, but nice. Um, my favorite part about being a lineman is yeah. uh, it's when the phone rings and just getting out there and not knowing what you're getting into. But also the blessings it's been for myself and my family, you know, as far as, uh, it's a great career and I've met so many people along the way, uh, not just, uh, you know, monetary wise, but just, uh, just all the opportunities, the doors it's opened, you know, and, and, and the stuff that, you know, taking my family on trips, having that downtime with the vacations and, uh, um, and it's just, it's, it's just, I, I can't say enough about my work. It provides a, it provides a pretty good life. Yeah. Yes, it does. Yeah. Absolutely. If I could change one thing about the industry, it would be. Yeah. And I like to say safety, but it's such, it's going in such a positive direction. Yeah. Over the years. Very cool. uh, When I first started utility, we didn't cover, I didn't cover nothing up on construction. You know, I mean, I come out of climbing school. I was four months out of climbing school and me and the guy was learning how to climb with we're going through private right away laying out buck arms hot sticking you know four months out of climbing school you know with the ground we didn't have, even have a, the foreman's down there with the journeyman doing what bucket access they could do but you know it was if you can do it you do it you know um i'm a second generation lineman my dad had a power line contracting company like all when i was growing up the whole time I, I was growing up and, uh, he, we lived in a small town in kind of rural British Columbia and he quite often would have to put linemen up at our own home because it was really hard to pay him per diem and all that. So we get linemen from all over the place. And my mom would, my mom also worked in the business on the office side and they would often put linemen up in her home. She'd make them dinner. We'd give them a bed to sleep in that sort of stuff. So I'd have, we'd have linemen like stay and some old boys and just listening. I remember like growing up, just like listening to their stories at the kitchen table and to go from where it was then. And that's only 50, 60 years ago, you know, when they were coming up as youngsters in the trade to where it's at now, it's definitely, like you said, safety's definitely come leaps and bounds from then. Right. <laughs> In our career, and then even you just go back one step to the next guy behind you, their career, it's just changed so dramatically. Yeah. 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 But now I'm the old guy telling them yeah. stories. <laughs> That's all right, though. That's good. <laughs> okay. Last one. Uh, best, the best advice I've ever received as a lineman. And it's one I tell, they hear it all the time, is you can learn something from everyone, good and bad. You know, pay attention and watch. If you're standing on the ground there, watch everybody in the air. And you can see, and a good apprentice, you know, I'll ask them all the time, 
you know, what do you see up there? What's going on? What would you do different? And uh, like, well, he's doing that, but I think this would work, you know, like, yeah, that's good observation. Just, just watch and, and learn from other people. You know, you don't have to have your elbows in it to, to learn, you know, I mean, obviously it helps to, to have the hands on the wire and, and doing that and being in that process, but there's some downtime just watching people and thinking, what in the world is going on there? Yep. You know, but, and keeping that in the back of your mind that don't get yourself in that kind of bind, you know, or that's cool. I'm going to try that next time. It's paying attention to the details too, when you're watching or, I still do that too. That's something I learned in line work. I'm glad you brought this up because some, something I learned and I still apply that in everyday life today. It's, it's watching the details. I remember when I was like, when I was trying to learn how to climb, I'd watch the old guys climb and like, I would watch how they were even like moving their feet, like how they were twist, twisting their legs or like how they were placed, like just the details too. So that's watch the details, not just like the big picture. Right. Try to stay a step ahead and figure out what they're going to need next. Yeah. Yeah. That's huge too. Don't get caught. Make sure you're, you've, you've planned everything out on the ground to pass up to the guys <laughs> as they need it. Um, what's the, uh, what's your YouTube channel? Uh, clumsome 1993. Perfect. Cool. Um, so anyone wanting to know rodeo tips and tricks, go check that out. Uh, there's a little bit of hunting stuff on there too. Nice. You know, a little variety. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. Where else people get a hold of you if they have any other questions about the foundation or climbing or whatever? Uh, the climbing for kids um, email at anwin.com is the best way. Um, and then we'll, we'll get a hold of you from there. Just not trying to put out all my personal stuff, but uh, also just shoot me a message through the YouTube channel too. Perfect. And uh, I can point you in the right direction here too. Appreciate everybody willing to help for sure. Every dollar counts. My daughter, daughter, she did a uh, lemonade stand and raised like sixty bucks one. Yes, we put that. In. Yeah, that's really cool. We'll do what we can to help you out, and that that's that should be super good cause. Well, thanks for being on the show. Uh, I appreciate you taking the time out of your day. I appreciate you having me on here, man. It's a uh, it was cool. I didn't know what to get expect to get it. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode with Jason. I I really, really love that episode. He's such a knowledgeable guy, been in the industry for 30 years now, and yeah, 22 years at the ILR, he's a foreman lineman. Just you can see the depth of knowledge he has in the industry, in the industry and in the trade. Um, so again, hope that you guys find it within you to do whatever you can, whether it's a financial donation or whatever type of donation or, or help for his cause, Climbing for Kids. We'll have all the details here and in the description to donate or get involved for raising money for St. Jude's Children's Hospital uh, for the cancer, cancer ward at St. Jude's. So great cause. I hope you can find it within you to do that. All right, guys, play safe, do all the good things, subscribe to the channel, whether it's YouTube, or on the audio platform you're listening to this on, like, follow, comment, please get involved in the community. I wanna hear from you guys out there. All right, play safe, be good out there. See you on the next one, peace.